Hi guys, good evening. I am your online course from axi.com. The next file. And just add to add the file related to the inevitable group. And before entering into this one, this file, we also have another file. And just a smaller group. What is called phylum Tinophora? Tinophora. This is another phylum. I have not given any notes here, but you have to know something about this Tinophora, a small phylum. And this phylum actually includes really asymmetric animals, just like the Cyrillix. And normally, these animals coming into this category are called home genetics. Home genetics or sea walnuts, sea walnuts, a minor group just like celery, which includes home genetics and sea walnuts. These are all radially symmetrical animal, triploblast or diploblastic animal, just like uh, the celery, a slightly somewhat advanced than that of the celery. That is why they are coming into the next group. I have not given anything about this one in the slide that knows. So I will just understood some points for this one. And which includes animals, sea walnuts and comb jellies. And in these animals, actually there are eight ciliated plates on the surface of the body. Suppose the animal is more or less spherical. We have eight ciliated plates are formed like this. Ciliated plates. Eight ciliated plates are formed. And that is why they call also comb jellies. And these animals are normally hermaphrodites. One peculiar character they exhibit bioluminescence. I mentioned about this one under Noctiluca, an animal, animal protist, having the ability of actually exhibiting bioluminescence that is nothing but emission of cold light or life light. So this is also an example for the genoform is also an example for bioluminescence character. The examples, for example, tinoclura. Tinobrachia, Tinobrachia, Tinobrachia. These are all the examples for this group, Tinophora. And simply remember, comb jellies, sea walnuts, main character, they have eight, that is ciliated plates found on the surface of the body. The body is more or less looking like a line, a spherical structure. But the animals have one another character I mentioned earlier, bioluminescence. So this is somewhat a minor phylum, having only limited number of animals. Now let's pass on to the next phylum, a slightly advanced group than those of the Nidarians. Phylum Platy Halbindus. So the animals are named so because the body is very much flat, dorsal and treble. That is why the name is given Platy and Halbindus. So the study of bones is called Helminthology. The study of bones is called Helminthology. And here the word Helminthus refers to the bones and Platy the word Greek word refers to the flat, so flat bones. And, and this is the first group in the what is called the invertebrate category having bilateral cement. And that is the first triploblastic animal in the invertebrate group, the first triploblastic animal and first bilateral symmetric animal in the invertebrate group. And according to the nature of the sea bone, I mentioned earlier under the classification, these animals do not have any body cavity. The body cavity is simply absent. The space between the body wall and the gut is filled with a kind of tissue, what I mentioned earlier in the previous classes, mesenchyme or parenchyma. So no space between the body wall and the gut. The space is normally filled with a kind of a mesodermal tissue what we call this one as mesenchyme or parenchyme. And I mentioned earlier the body is dorsoventrally compressed. That is why the name is given as the flat bones. And in this case, most of the animals are parasitic. Only few are free living. Let's see some of the relatives. So, mostly endoparasites parasites, and only few of them are free living. When we have the parasitic forms, the parasitic forms always have some adaptations for attachment to the body of the host. And for that they have hooks and suckers. So in the case of parasitic forms, either they have suckers or they have both hooks and suckers for attachment.
they act as cold fast organ or for sucking the food from the parasite. It is one of the parasitic adaptations. When you say parasite, a flatworm, just in the case of such parasitic flatworms, they have either hooks and the suckers or only suckers alone. Now, as another adaptation regarding the parasitic nature, so normally in the case of parasitic forms, the digestive system is poorly developed or even absent. So in the case of two organisms, namely planaria and also liver flu, we have some of the digestive system is present. Some of the digestive system is present. So the liver flu, fascia hepatica, the liver flu doesn't actually have a completely developed digestive system. So the digestive system may be present as in the case of liver flu or in the case of planaria or completely or totally absent as in the case of tapeworm. So no digestive system in the case of tapeworm. The body is made up of many segments and all the segments are actually absorb the food directly from the external medium. And normally in the case of parasitic forms as they are living inside the body, it may be the digestive system, particularly the intestinal parasites. As they are taking the instant food directly, there is no need to, there is no need for them to have the digestive system develop. So in the tape home, there is no digestive system. So now how for the animal is normally absorbing the food? We have different modes of nutrition, you know that one, heterotropic. Under this heterotropic, we have parasitic, saprophytic, or we have the holozoic other types of nutrition, even the blood eating type as in the case of leeches. Now in the case of tapeworm, now the food particle is being absorbed directly through the body surface. Such a type of nutrition that is now with the diffusion of food from the external medium into the body of the organism is called osmotrophic nutrition. So tapeworm is an example for osmotrophic nutrition. It is nothing but the diffusion of particles from the external medium into the body of the parasite directly by simple mechanism of diffusion from higher to lower concentration. Then, some more characteristics. Now, actually, in most cases, for example, in the case of fascia hepatica, that is liver flu, or in the case of uh, planaria, the degasia, in these cases, we don't have any segmentation. But in the case of tapeworm, if you are taking the tapeworm, the body of tapeworm is made up of an anterior cold first organ, namely the scullus and posterior body, you see later. And the body is made up of many segments. But these segments are not considered as a true segments. So normally, though the animal body in the case of tapeworm is divided into many segments, it is normally showing what is called pseudo metamerism. The best example for pseudometamerism is the tape. So, what do you mean by pseudometamerism? What is the difference between true metamerism and pseudometamerism? See, in the case of Erto, it is an example for true metameric organism. Where the body is divided into many segments. And all the segments are alike. Except in a few at the anterior and posterior ends. And each segment has a representative part of all the systems. So normally in the case of true metameric animals, new segments are added at the posterior end. So we have the older segments at the anterior and new segments or the younger segments at the posterior. But in the case of pseudometamerism, not all the segments are added. The size of the segments are increasing from the anterior end to the posterior. So the meaning for that one, here new segments are added at the anterior end not at the posterior end. So, the segments at the anterior end are just younger ones and the segments at the posterior end are older ones. This is the difference between true and then pseudometamerous animals. So, there you have the older segments at the posterior end, sorry, at the anterior end and here we have the older segments only at the posterior end because the new segments are added near the anterior end, near the neck region. Then, so for each category of form, that is the invertebrate group, we have some peculiar characters. For nidarians, we have the stinging cells and nematoblasts. For sponges, we have the coinocytes and canal system. And likewise here, there is a peculiar type of cell is formed. The cell normally called as the flame cell or cellular cells. 
It helps specialize the cells, what are called the flame cells for excretion. And these cells are also called as solenocytes. Solenocytes. The cells also called the solenocytes. So, the flame cells are the organs of excretion in the case of taping. So, you remember, each category has specific cells. I mentioned all in the case of sponges, coinocytes. Then, in the case of cellular leaks, we have the stickings of the nematocyte, or the nematoblasts, or the nidocytes. Then, we have the flame cells, the solenocytes, or platyhelminthes. members. Each one has its own specific function. We have to make a match, matching practice. So, which one of the following path is true or incorrect? The question may be asked in that manner. So, we have just normally the flame cells, the organs of excretion, in the case of platforms. Now, the nervous system is present on either side, the ventral nerve cord, just like what is called ladder like nervous system. So, this is the first group, develops some of the nervous system. We have the nerve cord is present, that is ventral laterally. And looking, they are interconnected, giving the appearance of a ladder. So, a ladder like nervous system. And the brain is there, but the brain is not well developed. That is why it is considered as a primitive brain. Now, all the animals are hermaphrodite. They are actually malicious organisms. So, we are using the word kerma products or bisexual or malicious. So, I will come back once again. Now, actually, the flame cells are responsible for excretion as well as osmo regulation. So, in case of protozoans, for example, amoeba or any other organisms, we have a peculiar structure formed in the case of protozoans for osmoregulatory activity, namely the contracted vacuum. So, the meaning for osmoregulation is the maintenance of water content of the body. The excess of water found in the body is being eliminated to maintain the normal content in the body. That phenomenon of maintenance of normal content of water in the body is called osmoregulation. So, in the case of human beings, we have the kidney that performs the function of osmoregulation regulation and excretion. So, by excreting large amounts, suppose you are taking large amount of water in order to maintain the concentration of the blood, the excess of water present in the body is eliminated. Suppose you have just little amount of water in the body, the kidney prevents the excretion of water. So, this phenomenon of maintenance of water content in the body is called osmoregulation. regulation. In amoeba, it is being performed by just the contracted vacuum. In the case of platyhelminthes mingus animals, it is being performed by the flame cells. In human beings, it is performed by the kidney. There, now let's go. Ahead. So, the animals are malicious or bisexual or hermaphrodites, having both male and female reproductive organs in the same body. And in most cases, the development is indirect. So, whenever I am using the word indirect development, that means there is a larval stage. There is a larval stage. So, there are many larval stages in the case of these organisms. So, and actually the animal is completing or the parasitic forms are completing the life cycle in two hosts. The parasitic animals are completing the life cycle in two hosts. So, that means they have a primary host and a secondary host. Or we can say primary host is called a definitive host and the secondary host is called an intermediate host. So, they have one or more intermediate hosts to complete the life cycle. There are many larval stages. And in some forms, I mentioned earlier, we have many larval forms. Polyembryony is common. Polyembryony means at a time more than one embryo is formed. Say in the case of a pig, at a time, it is the animal, the only animal which gives back more number of individuals in a later. So, that condition of production of many embryos at a time is called polyembryonic. So, here we have, there is a polyembryonic condition. In the case of liver flow, there are many larval stages, namely neurasidia, then sporocyst, radia, cercaria, metacercaria and so on. So, one of the larval stages named the sporocyst. This is one of the stages, larval stages during the life cycle of blood flow or the liver flow. So, one such stage is porosis. This porosis produces many radia. Another larval stage, the next larval stage, many radia. 
and this sporosis, a single sporosis produces many radial larva and that is the best example for polyembryony in the case of liver fluke. As I mentioned here, the sporosis state in the liver fluke produces many radial stages and each radial develops into another larva. So that is a known example, polyembryonic, you can see in the case of liver flow. So that is another question also. Now, what we have, the classification. This group includes three different types of classes. Number one, turbulent. This is the only class which includes free living forms. The organisms are called, just actually the planarians. The common name, planarians, the scientific name, ligation. Now these animals normally are free living form, even they have the eyes also. The presence of eyes, you can see in the case of these organisms, a pair of eyes we can see, large eyes. One of the peculiar character, the epidermis is ciliate. That is why it's called ciliated cellular epidermis. You have a number of cells like this. This is epidermal cell having many cilia, hence called ciliated epidermis. And some of these cells have the ability of secreting mucus with the help of some structures present in them. Such structures are responsible for secreting a viscous mucus called abdiates. These are not the cells, but structures found in the epidermis are responsible for the secretion of mucus for the gliding movement of the animal. So both the cilia and the mucus responsible for the gliding movement of the organism helping in locomotion. So the nanobites or mucus secreting structures present in the epidermis. And another important character. So you have in the animal kingdom, some of the animals have the ability of regenerating themselves, even some of the parts being lost. So most important animals are one, the sponges, the second one, hydra, the third one you have just the planarians. And the fourth one, we have the starfishes. <coughs> These are the four animals which have the ability of just regenerating their last parts. Suppose, for example, in the case of planaria, if you cut the animal into three, say, for example, this anterior part having eyes, cutting into three. And once these parts are cut into three pieces, each piece has the ability of just regenerating their second and third parts. So this is what is happening, this is what we call this one, the power of regeneration that is exhibited by the planarians. So we have the power of regeneration in sponges, hydra, planarians and starfishes. These are all the examples where we could see the power of regeneration. Now class trimetora. And this class includes animals which are commonly known as flows. We have two different types of flows. One is a liver flow, another one a blood flow. The liver fluid is not found in the human body, but it is a parasitic form, a parasitic form, a parasite of what is called the sheep. And now, and these parasitic forms are actually called the suckers, and the gastrovascular cavity is bifurcated in the case of liver fluid, trematoda. So, they have two suckers. One anterior sucker, suppose you have a diagram of liver fluid, I'm drawing a simple diagram. This is one of the suckers, another sucker is surrounding the mouth. They have two suckers. And both the suckers, normally one sucker is used for attachment in the case of liver flow, another sucker is used for absorption of food from the body of the host. Now, the liver flow or the blood flow, they show that is many larval stages during the life by what I mentioned earlier. The different larval stages are in order of arrangement. And this is the first larval stage, then a cilia. This is the first larval stage, we have a seed. This is a free living actual larval form. The next one we have the sporosis. That sporosis is the next stage, we have the third one radia. Many radia we produce by a single sporosis, and each radia develops into the fourth stage of larva, namely cercaria, and now the last one, the metasarca. This is the order of arrangement of the larval stages. First larva, second larva, third larva, fourth larva. And then just the fifth one, you have to know the sequence, correct sequence of the larval stages. So the sporosis produces many radia, hence we are calling this one as a polyembryonic condition. Now, the example liver fluid, fascia hepatia. Now it is an example for diagenetic pass because it completes its life cycle in two hosts. One is one is the sheep. One is the sheep. Another one, just what is called a snail of 
genus Limnaea, species Trangatula, Limnaea Trangatula. So the sheep normally considered as a primary host or definitive host. The animal lives in the bile duct of sheep, hence called as the liver flow, the bile duct of sheep. And it causes a dangerous disorder, causing damage to the liver, liver or disease. It causes liver or disease, not in the case of human being. Now, one host is sheep and another host is Limnaea, a molluscan animal, a snipe, Limnaea trangatula. That is why it's called a diagenetic parasite. A parasite that completes its life cycle in two hosts is called a diagenetic parasite. Now, another one, blood flow, Cystosoma hematobium. And that is the one which lives in the pelvic veins of human beings. It lives in the abnormal vein, in the pelvic vein. And causes one disorder in the case of human being, the most important question also, Bilharzia or Cystosomiasis. As the book causes the disease, is called Cystosomiasis, Bilharzia. So one actually man is a primary host. And the intermediate host is another a molluscan animal, a snipe, by genus Mullinus or Planorbis. There are two. So the animal has two intermediate hosts, one is a snipe bullinus, another one is also a snipe, what is called the glenorbis. And these are all the intermediate hosts to complete the life cycle. So the animal completes its sexual cycle in man, that is why man is called a definitive host or a primary host. And completes its asexual cycle in bullinus, that is why it is called a secondary host or intermediate host. The disease cause is called bilharzia. The main symptom of this disease, hematuride. Hematuri or hematuri. The meaning for that one blood in the urine. So when you are infected with this parasite, one of the symptoms of this bilharzia, that is the elimination of blood along with urine, and that condition is called hematuri. So that is another parasitic form. So both are coming under the class trematoda. Now class cystoda. And normally this group includes animals which are commonly known as a tapeworm. So, we have three different types of tapeworms, and all the tapeworms are diagenetic parasites. As I mentioned earlier, the body is divided into anterior collects. If you are taking the tapeworm, so this is the collex. So, that is the anterior pins like, actually, they are just like the pins head the signs and that is a scolex part. That is a scolex. And having four suckers, the scolex is normally having four suckers and anterior rostrum with a double circle top hooks. Two circle top hooks and these are all the hooks, the need like structures. And these suckers and hooks are not used for sucking the food. They are used for attachment to the intestinal wall. That is why the scolex is a whole fast heart again. So here is given whole fast organ. An organ is for attachment, not is for sucking the food. Because in the case of tapeworm, the absorption of food is taking place mainly through the body wall and mainly through just the body surface. That is called osmotrophic nutrition. That is why these suckers and nostril and the hooks are not used for absorption of food, simply for attachment. So it is also a diagenetic parasite. Now we have three different types of tapeworms. Now before that one, the body is called strabilia. The body is called strabilia. And we have just the addition of new segments is called strabilization. The formation of new segments is called strabilization. And normally the segments are called proglottids. The segments are called proglottids. Each segment is called proglottid. We have three different types of segments. So immature, mature, and then sorry, what is called gravid, immature, mature and grab. Immature without any sex organs, mature having a set of both male and female sex organs. The gravid present at the posterior end, they have actually the fertilized eggs. They are called gravid proglottids, G-R-E-V-I-P, gravid proglottids. So we have the gravid proglottids containing what is called the fertilized eggs. So once actually they are filled with eggs, they are being detached and pass on along with the feces. That phenomenon of actually the pinching off or the detachment of the gravid proglottis 
from the main body of the organism is called apolysis. Apolysis. This is nothing but pinching of uh, pinching of that is the gravid proglactis from the main body or the main body actually the mature proglactis I'm sorry the gravid proglactis having the eggs are being detached from the main body at pass point that phenomenon is called apolysis simply the separation or pinching of the segments from the main body so so normally in the case of tapo pseudo metamerism now we have the types of uh, segments what are called the proglactis Apolysis, these are all the common characters. It is also digenerative parasite. And here there are three different types of tapeworms. There are three different types of tapeworm. Actually, so, and actually the body is divided into many segments called proglottis. Now, the fetalized beings, and uh, within this body is called gravid proglottis, they undergo some sort of development before they are released from the body of man. The first embryo that is released along with the faces is called hexagon embryo hexagon also called as oncosphere oncos having hooks or needles so the nature of the hexagon embryo is spherical having six hooks or needles like this six hooks or needles this is an embryo that's the name is given hexagon oncosphere onco sphere shaped structure with a needle or hooks and that is the first one. So the embryo that is released from the body of man, some sort of development is completed and after that one it is being released. And this is the infective stage for the pig. When the pig is feeding on the feces, having this oncosphere, they enter into the body of a pig. There they develop into another larva, namely the bladder womb, also called the cystic cells. The womb in the case of actually tapeworm, just in the muscles of people called cystic circus and bladder womb. When a person is consuming a measly pore, a measly pore is the one which is contaminated with, the, which is filled with, or which is contaminated with the cystic circus blood. While we are consuming the food, the flesh or the pore, if it is not properly cooked, then the cystic circus enters into the body of man where it is once again developed into the adult table and remaining there. It is also notable that at a time in the body of man, only one table is formed. Unlike the round worms. There are many round worms at a time if you are infected with round worms. But in the case of man, at a time you have only one round worm, so only one table. So these are the two larval stages. One is the infective stage of pig. Now the hexagon is the infective stage for pig. And this cystic circus is the infective stage for man. So the parasite completes its life cycle in two hosts. One is man, another one is pig. So there is a pork table. We also have beef table. So in the case of beef table, man is the primary host and the cattle the secondary host. What is called tinea serginata. I'll give the table called now. There are three. See that one. So there are three different types of tapeworms. One tinea solium. The intermediate host for this one is a pig. That's why it's called a pig table. The second one, tinea serginata. And where the intermediate host is nothing but the actually, sorry, um, the beef, one, that is what is called a cat, hence the name beef table. The third one, echinococcus, the smallest table, the smallest table, echinococcus granulosus. This is called the dog table. For the first two, man is the primary host. And for the first one, pig is the secondary host. And for the second one, this cat is the secondary host. But for this echinococcus granulosus, the dog table, the dog is the primary host and man is the secondary host. And one question related to this one came in the AIMS question paper. A table having only three segments. A table having only three segments. And that is echinococcus granulosus. The person came in the AIMS question paper. So the smallest table, the dog table having only three segments, three proglottis. Now, what are the diseases caused? Now, the first two normally they cause teniasis, caused by the adult table, and cysticercosis, a disorder caused by a cysticercus larva. When present inside the body of man, penetrates the stomach wall, reaching the muscular system, causing the disorder. So, this is common to both what is called the pig and the cattle tapeworms. Whereas in the case of echinococcus granulosus, it causes a disease in man. The name of the disease is called hydated disease. 
That is why the verb is also called hydrated verb. Here we have developed some vesicles filled with the fluid. Some vesicles are developed, they are filled with the fluid and that is why the disease is called hydrated disease. So this is the comparison between these three take homes. Don't forget this echinococcus granulosis is the smallest take home having only three proglottids or three segments. So these are actually some of the diagrams showing and the pictures showing what we have the longest one. So the table normally has 800 to 900 segments in the body, what we call this one is trabella. Now in the case of liver fluke, the body is unsegmented but having two suckers and this is one, this is another. And the first sucker is normally surrounding the mouth, used for sucking the food. The second one just normally found in the body, just after the neck region, that is used for attachment. So it is a whole first organ. It's also called acetabulum. So this is anterior sucker and this is the posterior sucker. One is used for attachment, another one for absorption of food. And now let's have another final just related to a few words ago. So the next advancement group, the advanced one we can see, the round ones. And just one at a time, I will start up with this one. I will proceed further in the next class. We will continue further. You are most welcome to ask questions. Some of the people are interested to ask questions. I will answer also. I think so. There is no need to again post the answers in the online. So anyway, you are most welcome. So the class is completed. Thank you for everything.